to begin a new beginning, still looking for the answer. I cannot find the finish. I walk the maze of moments, but everywhere I turn to begins a new beginning, but never finds a finish. I walk to the horizon, and there I find another. It all seems so surprising. And then I find that I know. You go there, you're gone forever. You go there, I go you're there, gone forever. I lose my way. I go there, if we stay I lose here, my way. we're not together. If Anywhere we stay here, is. we are not together. Anywhere is. And would they let the light shine? The waves still keep on waving, and I still keep on going.
I walk the maze of moments, but everywhere I turn to begins a new beginning, but never finds a finish. I walk to the horizon, and there I find another. It all seems so surprising, and then I find that I know you go there, you're gone forever. I go there, I will lose my way. If we stay here, we are not together. Anywhere is. So, um, hello everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us. The first thing I'm going to mention, just so everyone's aware, that we are recording this event. Uh, so I hope that that's okay for everybody. Um, yeah, as I said, thank you very much for joining us. Um, we're here to celebrate uh, the people and all the work that's gone into making uh, this rather unusual uh, book object uh, possible. Uh, don't rest and rate. Um, and it's currently being launched here uh, alongside its presentation by the publisher Torpedo Press at this year's Printed Matter Art Book Fair. Um, Someone just joining, I'll just let them in. Um, so the book was developed following Praxis's seventh residency for a rainy day publishing as a site of collectivization, uh, which was organized by artist Is Ostan, I is. <laughs> um, Torpedo Press uh, and design studio Element R. Um, just, I'm just letting a few people in as I talk, so do excuse me. Um, so the, the film we were just watching uh, it's titled Looking Back at You to See if You're Looking Back at Me, and it's by Artist Collective, A-E-D-G-M-P-V. Uh, so again, hello, A-D-E-G-M-P-V, uh, many of whom have got coordinated backgrounds, not all. Um, and they describe the work as a virtual derive, uh, so it's a kind of uncharted journey uh, through gathered sounds, images, and games. Uh, and it was made as an extension of their artistic contribution uh, very beautiful poetic contribution to Don't Rest and Rate. Um, and it shifts the focus from the book's content to the hands that hold it. Um, and the film was made in response to the discussions that we were having about how to present this physical book that's been so much uh, thinking about, you know, how we participate in a book, what uh, the object of a book is and challenging that in a digital form. Uh, and so in a way, the film, you know, is looking to kind of take forward what had, had started here into, into a new form. Um, so ADEGMPV, I'm still getting used to, to getting that answer off the tongue, but uh, uh, Arise Masanza, uh, Daniela Muller, Eva Funk, Gabriel Parra, uh, Maria Gordana Bellic, Per Vesterlund and Vika Adetova. Um, they're based across Norway, Sweden, Switzerland, Germany, and the US, um, although not necessarily originally from all of those places. Uh, I hope that's everywhere that I've covered. Um, and they were the participants that were selected through open call for the For Rainy Day residency. So, um, my name is Nicholas, Nicholas Jones. Uh, I'm a founder and director of Praxis. Um, and Praxis's co-founder, Rachel Withers. Hello, Rachel. Hello, everybody. Uh, and I, we are together the editors for Don't Restorate. Um, so we'll be moderating today's event. Um, and as we start, I think it's really nice to get an idea of who we are coming together for this. Uh, so I'm gonna ask you all, if you are happy to do so, please, to type into the chat where you're joining us from. Uh, and at the same time, if you're happy, at least briefly to switch on your cameras, uh, it gives us a nice sense of the humans in the room together, rather than uh, speaking into my laptop screen. So uh, lovely to see some faces, some faces I have never seen before and some friendly faces as well. Well, not that faces I haven't seen before aren't friendly, of course, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah. Really nice to see so many people joining us. Um, and let me just add, um, 
about Praxis, I mean, for anyone who's not familiar with Praxis, we're an arts and culture catalyst is how we're describing ourselves at the moment, um, based in Oslo. Uh, and what we do is look to, to create uh, supportive environments for creative people to develop their practices and their careers um, through practice and exchange. Um, so I would like to say a huge thank you to everybody who contributed directly uh, and more supporting to making Don't Rest and Rate possible. Um, and I'd also like to say thanks to Arts Council Norway and to Stiftelse uh, Fritor, uh, whose financial support made uh, the printing and production of this actually possible. Um, I'd also like to add a very special thank you to Guttorm Guttormskor, who sadly passed away in 2019. Um, Guttorm's incredible generosity and warmth uh, gave so much to the project and to the residency that it stemmed from. So for the launch, we've got a variety of uh, interesting activity. Um, we've got some short talks relating to publishing and collective practice from Izos Tat and Elif Prestata. Hi, Elif. <laughs> And we've got uh, perspectives from the book's contributors uh, and a chance to ask questions and converse all together. Uh, and then we're going to finish up with the participatory game led by AED, G, M, P, and V. But right now, Rachel and I are going to spend a few minutes to summarize some of the key ideas and contents of the book. Uh, so I'm going to hand over to Rachel to share a presentation. Okay, the, the, this book really. Um sort of brings together three subjects so sort of three areas of practice and thought which are so enormous and diverse that that there's no there's no really um simple way of kind of venn diagramming them and so uh what we've attempted to do here is is just to sort of create some kind of placeholders that give a sense of what the book is aiming towards um as I think Nick has physically demonstrated, this is an unusual book simply to, in terms of its structure. It's a book in three parts, and here you can see an aerial view of it. Um, the aerial view is a little bit deceptive. It makes this look like this is a relatively sim, slim volume. In actual fact, it isn't. It's nearly 200 pages, and it measures about uh, a centimetre and a half in thickness. And its contents are very diverse and really aim to aim to think about meeting points between these sort of really um, these subjects, art, publishing and collaboration that are immensely difficult to tease apart. And so the book and its contents kind of interweave from one of these words, one of these areas to another in a, in a, in a, in a way that's very, very difficult to extricate. Um, but I'll try and point towards some of its directions and give a sense of, it, of its contents here. Um, so the book exists in three parts. It consists of originally created writing and um, image and text work that reflect the character in part of the uh, the creative residency out of which um, the book originally arose are collaborators who will be um, speaking to you and, and inviting you to work with them at the end of this session uh, were together for Oslo in for about a month give or take working together and developing a wealth of different ideas developing their individual practices at the same time forming um, a highly cogent collaboration, which is really the trigger for this book. Um, it's interesting thinking about the book in relation to what's, and I'm keeping my eye on the clock and realise I need to, I need to move on <laughs> fast here. But I think it's really important that we reflect on the, the, the you know, the intervening, the intervening experience of the human race, really, from the conception of this book now to its launch. Finally, the edit was completed about nine months to a year ago, um, and so this has been existed in print for some time. But one of the things that it reflects on is really the, the, a, a series of comparisons and contrasts and reflections on uh, both the, the integration and the differences between the worlds of the digital and the worlds of the real, and in particular, the realities, not just of experiencing art in 3D, in real life, in an embodied way, of working with other people in an embodied way, but also the, the digital dimension of that. And, and we've learned, thanks to COVID, just how 
critically important digital communications to, are as well, whilst yearning in a way for quote unquote the real thing for those embodied experiences. Um, so this is just one theme of the book and the book itself is designed to really highlight the physical nature of interactions with books. Um, the publishers themselves, Torpedo, um, pose the question, you know, their criteria, their reflections on publishing, how does the book smell, feel in the hand, lie on the table, appeal to the eye? Within the book, there are many experiment, there are experimental texts that bring image and text together and which probe the poetics of image and text and the use of that kind of language kind of against the grain, against its own grain of sense. Equally, there's some quite pragmatic contents here, which are reflecting on the politics, the social dynamics of publishing, definitions of publishing, issues within publishing in its many forms, both digital and physical. Um, and is herself, I'm sure, will have more to say about this in her presentation, which is coming up very soon. Uh, is herself has produced a kind of diaristic um, text for the book, um, which both reflects on ideas and interactions and gives a sort of chart of the residency. We have um, Oscar Kay's contribution, which is almost a kind of a, 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 a pub, a, an individual's guide to questions of copy left, copyright. The, pro the idea of a project fork declarate pub publication declarations free cultural license um, in addition to this though um, we have a, a large strand of discussion focusing in on collaboration and the dynamics of collaboration contributions from Ava Weinmeier her essay library underground a reading list for a coming community Mariah Lind has very kindly allowed us to republish her text collaboration 10 years down the line, where she concludes by reflecting that maybe it's time for us to reformulate solidarity and collectivity, invent something new. Gutom Gutom's Guard is represented uh, through um, a two part interview with the art historian LF. Prestotter, um, in which, uh, amongst many other strands of Guthorm's thinking and work and his amazing archive, he reflects on the dynamics of the book and the way in which the book itself forms uh, an almost par paradigmatic example of productive collaboration. Also contained within the book, we have an introduction which points in many, many directions to the polemics and the problems and the issues within art, collectivity and publication. We have an expanded reading list at the back of the book, including both websites and uh, suggestions for further reading books that we've found useful. Um, and so, uh, and, and in addition to that, a response to the, um, to the residency group's activities that was um, kind of catalyzed by the art historian, Martin Berner, Martin Berner Mattison, who's going to be contributing to the talk later on. The publishers have written a short contribution the graphic designers, Ella Med R, have also reflected on the font that was used for the book. And we have lastly, but very much not least, um, uh, a, a, a work, an image text work by the artist Hannah Hearson, um, Yellow, a monotone monologue, monologue which is um, uh, a, a, very, a, a, very, a very moving, a poignant work that intersperses through the whole this whole the complicated kind of concertina of a book um, and is um, a reflection on an experience, a, a, a really extreme experience of, of grief in her own life. I think oh. I've covered all the elements there, but I'd be very happy when it comes to the Q&A and Nick as well to say more about them. And I do have yeah. my eye on the time, so I think I'm yeah, going to wrap I, up I think here. That was <laughs> <laughs> a good run through because of the fact that we had uh, time uh, being of the at the moment but but I, I think the only other thing i'd like to add on top of on top of that really is that this book has not aimed to be a full comprehensive mm. survey of the subjects rather it's a kind of a project in, in movement it's been a learning process in of itself um and that we see it kind of as a a, a strong starting point that invites others to join uh and, and kind of has been an experiment in thinking about how you bring these different elements together and somehow in this presentation in a way 
separating them out allows us to address them but in many ways throughout the whole book they're really actually all interwoven so many of the things you talked about could be in any of those sections really. absolutely they're 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 they're, in, they're they're inseparable it's it's a complex weave it's it's something of a spider's web and we're hoping it's a spider's web that could actually that this could help people think about how it might be expanded how how further themes might be explored and, and, a, and a good example of that is that one part at the end of the book is a, a further reading section with a you know not, again not comprehensive but a really good start of where you can also continue you know bibliography and webography which i'm not sure if you mentioned but uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I did. You probably <laughs> did. Yeah, sorry, it's just such a run for it. Uh, no, no, I'm going to I'm going to stop the screen share now because I think we should be handing over to uh, is Ostat, who was exactly. uh, a key uh, uh, protagonist within the residency itself. Um, so, is would you like to take the mic? Thank you. I'll be thanking at the end and. Uh, I think we'll be thanking each other a lot throughout the presentation. Um, I want to use my time uh, to reflect uh, on the maybe initial part of the process that led to the book. And since the time we spent together, the people that I'll refer to as the group has worked together uh, much further. Um, so I'll be focusing more. I'll start from our collective experience at the beginning. Um, upon Nicholas's invitation to lead a month-long residency uh, in September 2017 in Oslo, uh, I suggested a residency titled For a Rainy Day, publishing as a site of collectivization, uh, departing from my own practice. And uh, through an international open call, uh, Vika, Maria, Eva, Araiz, Daniela, Gabriela, Gabriel, and Per joined the residency. Um, there was no expectation of collective production uh, since the participants have not chosen each other, but they were brought together through an open call. And um, the, very unexpectedly, the group has uh, been able to um, act uh, collectively almost immediately and I'll try to reflect on the context within which this immediate ability to act uh, collectively arose and we'll try to also think what else and we were definitely very lucky and some of it was alchemy but what else was there that also maybe um, allowed this for this to happen uh, my humble contribution was that I tried to invite group dynamics in which everyone was encouraged to contribute to shaping processes and experiences as equals, respecting and caring for each other's input. Uh, even before we met in Oslo, we started creating a reading list with everyone's input and uh, started dialogues from there. And at the beginning of the residency, um, everyone presented their work and we discussed text. Uh, we spent the first few days tuning into each other's subjectivities, practices and skills. And when the book came together, I found a beautiful um, definition of subjectivity in the glossary of Martin Berner Matheson's contribution to the publication called A Joyful Struggle. Um, and this uh, contribution was um, shaped uh, upon the group's invitation to Martin with the group's involvement somehow. So subjectivity here is defined as consciousness plus biography, plus language, plus stories, plus agency, plus desires, plus beliefs, and plus more. <laughs> so everybody brought a lot into the process uh, from their lives. Um, and I'll start sharing my screen here just to give a sense of um, some of the spaces and um, activities. Uh, in the first days, uh, we experienced having seven different languages between us. Uh, none of us communicated with the others in our mother tongue, and this diversity could have contributed to creating a dynamics that supports the invention of a 
language of our own and new rituals and games. So not having uh, already established common cultural background was also possibly contributing to us being inventive uh, with each other. Um, we had a very welcoming and enabling arrangement in, term of, in terms of spaces available to us. We used the Praxis office as well as the house pri provided by Praxis where I and Eva were staying and where we could have uh, meals together and with other guests. We also had many site visits and were given opportunities by different initiatives to respond to their spaces and resources. Um, one of the first topics of discussion was reflecting on the frameworks within which we practice. We asked how cultural producers could sidestep cultural, cultural production mediated by public and commercial institutions through strategies of negation, withdrawal, and opacity. These discussions were accompanied by the rifts into the forest and onto the sea. Uh, in our first week together, we visited Torpedo Press and they invited us to use their newly opened space pub at Biorvika. In trying to figure out how to respond to the new development site, the group came up with a performative action called It's a Good Exercise, which required tuning into each other, moving together, learning by doing, and reflecting on the collectively articulated experience. Uh, then Nicholas arranged us arranged a visit to Gutorm Gutorm's guards ar and um, archive at Blacker and LF, uh, the art historian and chair of the board of the archive, who is with us today, um, introduced a diverse selection of printed archive materials that exemplify both collectively produced content and political engagement. A few days after our visit, uh, Gutorm and LF invited us for an exhibition at Laker and handed over the keys to us, allowing us unlimited access to the archive. And LF was fully present to answer our questions and supported us with his knowledge and friendship in engaging with the community of things and people that came together um, at the archive site. Um, I wanted to lay out the context within which we started practicing because I believe the trust, friendship, and generosity offered by uh, Praxis, Torpedo, and Gutorm um, provided the necessary conditions for the collect collective experiences to be carried out. And since then, let me stop this for a second. Okay. And in the three and a half years that followed, uh, Vika, Maria, Eva, Arais, Daniela, Gabriel, and Per continued their collective work, mostly working at a distance via internet. Uh, I want to mention a few qualities of their collective work, which I have been observing and learning from, and it is uh, very poetic, and I'll be very, like, how I will speak about it now is, does not do justice to that, but bear with it. Um, they commit to collectively articulated experimental open-ended processes and uh, they play games following each other's leads. Uh, this can be as simple as uh, turning things, paper, words, sounds uh, in a circle amongst themselves. Then they rigorously reflect on what comes out and give it form. In the performative processes they trigger, they embrace chance, association, and improvisation. Uh, they have a commitment to playing together, as well as sharing skills and responsibility. Uh, over the years and in the process of working towards the book, it has been very impressive to see how, di how a different person uh, from the group has been responding to emails on behalf of the group. I think this division of labor and responsibility is what makes their collective work endure. Um, and they referred, started referring to themselves as VMEADGP as their work developed beyond the residency period. And I want to end by referring to their contribution to the book titled Looking Back at You to See If You Are Looking Back at Me and um, quote a few parts uh, from how they position their own collective work. Um, the collaborative process is necessarily unfocused and pays attention to the peripheries. 
While setting some rules, they still choose to work with soft and focused fluid material. Uh, with each ex exchange, their work uh, transforms itself. They are trying over and over again and always moving. Um, so we were going to the book launch that uh, created the new video and today we'll do an exercise together. So it, it's very, it's a very perpetual uh, process. Um, this trying over and over again and always moving is really significant. And they uh, invite others to contribute and take, take part in their processes. In the case of the book, they invited Martin Berner Matheson and Hannah Heisen engaging in a close dialogue with them in shaping their contributions. And today at the end of the session, they'll expand the invitation to you to play a performative game with them. And I want to thank, thank everyone who has made uh, possible and contributed to all the processes that shaped the book and continues beyond it. Thank you. Thank you, Iz. Um, I'd now like to hand over to our art historian, Oslo-based art historian, L.F. Prestato, who's going to say a little bit about Guttorm Guttormsgaard and his and 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 his in, his relationship to the book, to printing, to collaboration, and to cultural practice. Uh, L.F., would you like to take the mic? Thank you, Rachel. Hi, everyone. Good to see so many familiar and some unfamiliar faces even. Yeah, so uh, Rachel and Nick uh, asked me to give a brief presentation of Guttorm's concept of the book as a paradigm example of collective uh, production. And um, as this really is the starting point of the conversation between Guttorm and me included in this book that we're launching today, I'm going to uh, quite simply start by reading from that text. I'm going to share my screen for, with you because I've prepared some slides. Okay, so um, this is what it looks like in the book. The conversation starts by me asking Guttorm about his relationship to books, to which he replies. Books, the printed word and image, are the most important things of all for me. Every time I pick up a book, even if it's only a humble-seeming item from a flea market, it is as if it buzzes with all the voices that contributed to its making. Normally, only one individual gets his or her name on a book's title page, but a whole orchestra of inventors and craftsmen have made it possible. The people who made its paper, its fonts, or its printing machines, its designers, reproducers, typesetters and bookbinders, and many others. When I engage with large-scale projects, the idea of the book has been a constant reference point, not merely as a book, but as this buzzing orchestra. And further on, the book is the richest model I can imagine for carrying out something complex. So Guttorm's point here is that whatever vision the content of a book gives voice to, whether it's collective or not, the book as material object is collaborative by default. So collaboration is an almost inescapable condition of publishing. Now, artistic publishing often highlights and reflects upon this condition. And I think the book that uh, we're launching here today is a case in point. Although we, might, we may uh, want to ask if the notion of the classical orchestra with its hier hierarchical setup overseen by a solitary conductor is the best metaphor to describe the mode of collectivity that's, that is being demonstrated by its perhaps more unruly ensemble of voices. Oskar Jorn, the Danish artist and situationist uh, who turns up at multiple locations in Don't Rest Narrate, insisted that the model of the classical orchestra was inconsistent with the situationist mode of collaboration and suggested that the improvisational structure of a free jazz band might be a more fitting metaphor. So among makers of books, artists are not only among those most likely to highlight the collective aspects of bookmaking, they are also among those uh, most likely to try to master all those aspects in the attempt to craft the total vision and its expression through such aspects. One thinks of uh, figures such as William Morris, 
who self-published his own writings with his Count Scott Press. So in this case, his name uh, not only uh, appeared on the cover as the text's author, uh, he also, quote unquote, authored the book's layout and typeface. Ultimately, however, such heroic efforts perhaps only highlight what they seemingly overcome. I mean, the complex collectivity of the book as material object. And in the conversation, Guttorm and I uh, discuss a particularly telling and almost self-defeating example um, uh, of this. Um, through his um, solitary efforts, the Greenlandic missionary Samuel Kleinschmidt, who lived in the 19th century, produced dozens of books uh, in a print workshop set up for missionary purposes uh, uh, on, on, on Greenland. And Kleinschmidt would, would author these books using a, a Greenlandic tongue, a Greenlandic language, for, v, for which he himself had developed an orthography and for, v, uh, for which he himself had written the first grammar. He would he himself compose the lines of type and he would himself uh, print the pages. So even though the types and the ink, uh, the press and the paper for obvious reasons had to be uh, imported from Europe. This was quite close to a one-man operation. And the particular book we discussed in the conversation was printed in Nuuk, the capital of Greenland, in 1877. And it is a brief account penned by Kleinschmidt of the global spread of Christianity through the activities of missionaries such as himself. What is remarkable about this book from the perspective of Guttorm Skors Arkiv is not the story about the missions, however, but it's two illustrations. Uh, and, and these illustrations are an exceptional feature in Kleinschmidt's books, uh, which usually only included text. Uh, this is a, it's, it's basically a map that displays the, the spread of Christianity throughout the world. You will see that uh, Catholic countries are yellow, uh, Reformed countries are red, Orthodox countries green, uh, well, whereas Greenland is still white. What uh, is remarkable about this colorful rendering of the world is that it was not printed. With the aid of a compass, pens and watercolors, Samuel Kleinschmidt instead drew the world, indeed his worldview, by hand in every copy of the print run. And according to the official story, the print run would be 1600 copies. I don't think that is actually true, but still. So upon seeing this book and this entire world that comes out of a tiny, tiny volume. Guttorm, himself an atheist and highly critical uh, of the missionary activity and its imbrication in colonial dynamics, admits to being close to conversion. And the irony of story, the irony of this story, which we do not really, uh, or whose implications we do not really uh, touch upon in the conversation, is that there was another workshop, another printing workshop in Nuuk at the same time, run by Greenlanders responsible for the publication of the newspaper Atuagaglutit, which frequently featured astonishing color illustrations expertly printed on a lithographic press. So they would obviously be, uh, would have been able to help Samuel Kleinschmidt reproduce his worldview. And one cannot help but wonder what kept Kleinschmidt from knocking on their door just down the, down, the, down the street and ask for help in reproducing his drawing. Okay, so once the book is published, I'm showing you some more, um, some more lithos from Atua Gaglutit. Uh, I think the archive holds every single uh, issue of the newspaper published up until 1900. Once the book is published, new layers of complexity uh, are added. The busing orchestra gets an audience who may or may not be happy to sit still and listen. It is impossible to control the reception of a book once it is out in the world. A book about missionary achievements may end up in the collection of a non-believer who is less interested in the message than in the pitch and timbre of the material object. 
the book as a format of collective and differing reception was in part what attracted Guttorm when he fully entered the world of books in the late 1970s. At this point in time, he was a very successful graphic artist, a distinguished printmaker. And the format of the book represented to him an alternative to the gallery space and an art scene he found increasingly problematic and alienating. Books provided an immensely expanded field of graphic art and printmaking, more open and generous than the gallery system with its aesthetic and social strictures. This insight resulted in an extraordinary collection of books uh, from all times and places, as well as a long list of self-produced and often self-published books. I'm going to show you some of them now. So I'm showing you footage of three books, books now uh, via an artwork by the young Danish artist Anna Sofia Mattiasen, uh, whose long-term engagement with the archive goes back to another practice residency, actually. It's a remarkable work that will be made public on the archives website uh, in the near future. What you see here to the right is a book by the already mentioned Oscar Jorn. In the middle is a book by the Soviet constructivist architect Jakob Chernikov, who devoted the last decade of his life to the analysis of type fonts. And to the left is a book produced by Gutter himself called Werkstead or Workshop from 1997. I don't know if you can make it out. I, I uh, suspect that my line is a bit fragile and that the resolution may not be ideal. Uh, but here the book is, is, is a tool to explore one single image, the oldest known image of a printing press. This picture belongs to the genre of the dance of death, the danse macabre, and it depicts a print shop haunted by a group of ghastly figures. It is a scene of collaborative work unsettled by mortality. And as any allegory, it can be interpreted in different ways. To Guttorm, the deathly figures represented not the death that unites us all, but the market forces of capitalism, whose development went hand in hand with that of print culture in the West. However interpreted, the, images, the image is, is in this book animated through layers of mylar transparencies uh, in a mode that is both analytic and expressive. And as you hopefully saw in the video, the original woodcut dating from 1499 only appears toward the very end uh, of the book. The occasion for the making of this book was an initiative by Guttorm and others to establish what they called a workshop library, so Verksted Biblioteke, in the National Library of Norway. A library, Guttorm insisted, should not only contain knowledge inscribed in books, but mediate the material, social, and creative complexity of books. It should be a stage for a myriad buzzing orchestras. Now, a workshop library should obviously include its own printing workshop. And in this 1994 uh, news clip, uh, Guttorm is posing with what is described as the Rolls Royce of printing presses, which he wanted to donate to the National Library uh, exactly for the purpose of setting up a workshop library on their premises. Now, this idea never came to fruition uh, there, but today, as we're working towards some form of institutionalization of the archive, we're trying to, to resuscitate this idea of the workshop library. And I've suggested that a workshop library should not only be seen as a library equipped with the workshop and printing tools, but as a library where the books themselves are seen as tools to tune into the buzzing sounds of a multiplicity of ensembles. So I think such a library would uh, entail a fundamental reconceptualization of traditional library models. And perhaps it's a utopian idea. It's, it's briefly touched upon in the conversation between Guttorm and me included in the book. So it's mentioned there, but I think more importantly uh, than this mention, I believe it's ethos or attitude uh, resounds throughout Don't Trust Narrate as a whole. So whether consciously or not, the buzzing orchestra resonates in the book's restless 
narration. So that's what I have. Thank you. I'm excited to be here with you today. Ella, thank you very much indeed. Um, it occurs to me that um, uh, folks who are attending this online event uh, may well like to learn how they can um, uh, stay in step with news from the archive, from the Gotong Gotong Skol archive. And, uh, and I'm wondering, could you potentially drop a link or maybe a couple of links into our chat column so that those who'd like to learn more um, can find out more from the archive itself? Indeed, I'll do that right away. Thank you. Now, though, I'd like uh, to uh, hand over to our residency group themselves um, and also to Martin Berner Mattison. And I'm thinking, Nick, here we've got a little bit of, of sort of on the hoof planning to do um, because we have a, 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 a short contribution from Martin, but also a coordinated contribution from the residency group themselves. And I'm wondering what order this should run in within the book um, we have a text um, that was uh, constructed as a response to the residency by Martin Burnham Mattison and I'm wondering Martin if this time again it might be appropriate for the group to make their presentation and then if you would like to respond to it afterwards I'm uh, 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 and contribute your thoughts I appreciate that I'm slightly putting you on the spot here but um, is this a good arrangement folks uh, if you'd rather work the other way around then then Evidently, that's fine as well. Um, uh, Martin, and, and maybe maybe is on behalf of the group, would you like to, to uh, plan, a, uh, plan, plan the agenda? Uh, yes, that's, that's great. First of all, I want to say thank you for being uh, invited to be part of this. And I want to say a few things just about the, the publication. I, um, I find it as a complex, colorful and interesting publication. It's sort of like a little wunderkammer of ideas, uh, both visual, textual, and discursive and associative. And I found parts of the book very interesting reading through it. I felt it had an impromptu and playful feel, even if the subject matter at times could be forceful. It's wonderful how some of the publications texts talk with each other while leaving enough space for my own internal dialogue. <clears throat> As a reader, I sense being positively uh, activated by the design and layout of the book, both on the side of the content and the materiality of the publication. And I don't know if you, I, I had some, some personal uh, curiosity that was awakened when reading the text, the case studies by uh, Elif Pressetter and Rachel Withers, as well as the text, the uh, library underground on the radical publishing and pirate publishers. So that was my sort of general comment on the publication. But it was also uh, very interesting for me to, to learn more about the residency that was sort of the initial uh, that my text took, took as a point of departure. So, <laughs> yeah. Martin, thank you very much indeed. And, and in fact, what you've called attention to is the one thing that um, uh, uh, the one element in the book that I didn't actually mention in my overview, which is that there is also a section with a series of 16 case studies relating to art and publishing and collectivity, which look at a series of, of in some cases, very well known and in other cases, less well known um, examples that, that kind of fit into our kind of non Venn diagram that this book that this book is describing. Um, such as, for example, a, a, sh a short section talking about um, uh, the, the, pub the, the publication that didn't happen, Dada Globe, um, through to much more recent examples of um, artists and activists working at the conjunction of collaboration and publishing and, uh, uh, and, 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 and art practice. Um, for example, the organisation Art is Open Source. Um, Araith and company, Daniela, Ava, Gabrielle, Maria, and Pear and Vika, are you ready to take over the mic? I'd like yes, to hand thank over. you, Rachel. So, hello, everyone. This is ADEGMPV speaking. We decided to talk about our working process and share it at the same time. 
We have given each other questions and answered them collectively. We will now read the questions and answers. The person who is reading is probably not the one who wrote it. How to know when to finish? Never stop. The end of something is weirdly always a beginning of something else. The page is full. So what kind of person is yellow? I started seeing yellow everywhere. Yellow can be warm and cold, positive and negative. It's a signal color, but at the same time, it is hard to read. Yellow is a friend. Yellow is a potato. Yellow was born when we learned that the publication would only have two colors. We chose yellow and black. Later, we learned that the publication actually could be printed in full color. But then we had already created a relation to yellow and we stick to it. How to move without a center? Moving goes in waves. It needs a lot of repetition to see what stays in the end. It's a slow process. Echo, echoing. Sometimes the waves keep coming even after the wind has died. You have to be ready to endure. It requires constant balancing, bringing in, but also holding back. Words get translated, differently interpreted, forgotten even. The glossary becomes an anchor. You might feel that the collaboration has run out of fuel. And then another member in the group starts whistling. And then you feel like, aha, that was what we were doing. I like that. Let's continue. What role did time and space play in the publication? The space is endless. We are spread out and together at the same time. We have been physically separated for quite a while now. Our way of talking with each other is influenced by online communication. Technical problems take time away. We meet in the virtual space. We see only a glimpse of each other's lives. There is organization and chaos at the same time. We have been together while individually each of us has gone, has gone through different phases and places. We unavoidably have changed over time, yet we try to embed our way of working as much as possible in whatever situation we are in. We are very fast and very slow at the same time. How did you decide the order of the links in your games? Is the order important? Randomly, randomness has been another good friend of ours. Always there for you when you need it and when your other friends aren't so easy to read. I still need a post-it to remember our positions. How are decisions made? I'm wondering if we are acting on consensus or compromise. Never really figured that out. But early on, we agreed on trusting each other and let things evolve. I can sometimes have the feeling that everyone else in the group has agreed upon something and all know something that I have missed out on. During a Skype, for example, a name of a software, a software can be mentioned and two or three members can start talking about it. If I don't recognize the name of the software, it leads me to think that I haven't read a WhatsApp thread carefully enough. Then I can be afraid of letting that show. So I just agree on anything anyone says. But I think that is something that comes with all groups of people. One always feels included and excluded at the same time. Chance is often prevalent. Where is your voice in this? I'm not really looking for my voice in it. I just know it's there 
and was shifted into something else and that's liberating just because the individual voice can't be heard it doesn't mean it's not there our individual voices have become a seven-legged cat the good thing about working in this way is that our voices merge together all the time and somehow sometimes it feels like you can't talk louder like seven oceans or seven islands well as important as thinking about one's voice within a collective is understanding when to be silent silence is an important tool sometimes too how have you generated your working methods archipelagic thinking meets office tools we look at each other and into ourselves. The relationship between us is the working tool. Nothing is precise and everything is fragile. Always taking certain regulations as a starting point to change rules. What was the most difficult thing while working with this publication? We have a body of seven which sometimes moves very slowly. I'm used to being quite quick by myself. I need to get adjusted with the speed and learn to be patient. And the Zoom meetings have been difficult because when you say something, it is as if you talk on behalf of all seven, but you only speak for yourself. And honestly, I don't know what the others think. So sometimes only the fear of the awkward silence gives me the motivation of starting to speak. What are your future plans? How to move forward from this? To answer that would require a kind of collective rest, a shared debrief or post-mortem. I'm not sure we should do this as much as I'd also like to just give it a rest and play cards instead. But I'm scared that this could be the end. Even though we can look back at the vast body of work, I'm still not sure what holds us together. But it feels like a serialized novel that always ends with a cliffhanger. And I'm excited to see where it leads to. How elastic is the chain? Like all chains, sometimes it can get kind of rusty, but you just need to add some oil. Linkages don't have to be fixed. Where are you carrying to? No idea. How do you rest? Just today I was wondering why there is this title. Sometimes I wish it would be swapped. Enough with the narration. Let's just collectively give it a break and play cards. Why Enya? Why not? Anywhere is Orinoco flow wild child what has been the killer question where is your voice what will you do how are you what time can you skype how do you feel about it who wants to craft the email and send it will you continue working as a collective Hope so. How do you edit texts or other material? Sometimes it could happen that you start a sentence and in the meantime, somebody else is already finishing it. What did you expect the publication to be like? I have no idea what the publication will turn out to be since I never had an overview of it. 
many mails have been sent and replied to over a few years. I'm a member of a group that was commissioned to do an artistic work for it, and the group decided to commission two additional people. That made it more blurry, but also more distinct at the same time. What's your collective name? A D E G M P V. You can sing it. It's like the ABC. So yeah, that's that's it. And if you have questions, we are going to have a Google Doc game in the end of the book lounge. And um, you're re really welcome to join us and to play with us. And you're invited to ask us and the others about everything and there will be answers. Uh, so feel free to answer any question and also share with us your thoughts. And I really would like to take um, now this time to also say thank you to everyone involved in this project. It was like a really incredible adventure. And um, also the question about, um, do you think if we will co collaborate together? I think it's also a question to all of us here in the chat. And I hope that everybody is also answering hope so. So thank you. It's a, a really nice way to uh, experience your process uh, and, and think about things you've been dealing with. And it's a nice way, I think, also for us to now lead into, um, first of all, conversation, comments, questions uh, between everybody that's here before uh, stepping over into the, the game that you guys mentioned. Um, so I would like to, I think there can be also discussion between the various parts of us who have been involved, but I would be very happy if anyone uh, in the audience has any questions or comments or things that they would like to bring up at this point. And if you find it difficult to speak up, you're very welcome to write, I have a question or I would like to say something in the chat and then we can uh, yeah, moderate and move it over to you. So. Nick, can I ask a question of the audience? Um, uh, my understanding is that um, I, would actually, I, have a, I have a comment from the publishers, Torpedo, who said that um, uh, that the book, they say, their book gains new meaning by virtue of the different contexts it will be part of. Um, it should now have been presented side by side with other books in a hot, sweaty, crowded room at PS1 and been held and explored by many hands. And I was thinking, crumbs, <laughs> has this really happened? Folks, can you give me, you know, are Torpedo correct in thinking this? I mean, I'm hoping everyone's been staying about. safe. But uh, <laughs> What they're talking but, about there is that it should now be being launched at the Printed Matter. At uh, the Printed Art Matter Book Fair. Book. Which mm -hmm. takes place at the at PS1 and would have mm -hmm. many. But instead, it's being presented at the Printed Matter Virtual Art Book virtual, Fair. Virtual, but yes. Whereby it yes. no longer goes into <laughs> people's hands and passes between. So. That you've allayed my fears there. Um, <laughs> but yes, I'm wondering, um, I, I don't know if, if anyone uh, in the group as well would like to um, uh, to maybe um, uh, give a give a flavour of, of how this is fitting into the rest of the rest of the event. Um, but of course, Nick, I, the whole of the rest of the team who are involved in this, would be very happy to answer questions, specific questions about the book. So. I have a question. <clears throat> um, it, I'm sure this was probably said in the beginning, but I'm wondering, did you originally say? let's have a collective residency experience. What would you guys like to do? And it ended up, oh, hey, what if we put everything in a book? Or was it, you know, it's COVID. No, it wasn't COVID then. So, you know, let's make a book. Okay, let's make it collective. How can we do that? I mean, it's really interesting to me. And maybe I didn't pay enough attention when I looked at the uh, information about this meeting, and I was thinking, yes, putting art in books, what a great idea. And some of the original information, I think, said something like an exhibit is so short. And if you make a book um, about the exhibit, then later you have this artifact, you have this material representation of the exhibit. So what I saw today was totally or somewhat very different than that. So I'm kind of wondering, was was the book like we had an, 
an amazing, crazy collective month. Let's document it. Or we want to make a book. Let's do that collectively. If that question makes sense. Thanks. Thanks, Carol. That does make sense. And I just want to say hello because I think we met before <laughs> in a in an event called um, Praxis Development Forum um, about about a month ago. Um, so welcome back. Um, I'm wondering if this would be good to hand over to a member of the collective to 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 reply to. Um, would somebody in the collective like to to talk to Carol's question? At, at what point? Did the book idea emerge? Maybe Nick as well, I'm sure. As, um, I sort of came in, you know, I was just following orders, I'm afraid. I, I, <laughs> that, that's a bad joke. Um, I, um, I, I sort of got, got sort of in editorially involved when, when the book was a given and, um, uh, and it was clear that um, there was lots of possibilities yeah. and uh, it was involved quite a lot of editorial work. Maybe, I mean, so, uh, I think you're right, Louise Tanner, but I think the it's a good question, Carol, and, and an interesting one that maybe isn't obvious. Um, but actually, when we started the residency, there was no intention to make a book. And also the book is, although it stems from what happened during the book, it's not really a documentation of the residency either. It intends to be kind of its own, somewhere between a resource for people who are interested in topics around art, collaboration uh, and publishing, uh, but also a kind of art object and an exploration in its own right. So it's sort of moment in a broader process. But um, yeah, I'm not, not wanting to take all it. But effectively, at the beginning, there was no expectation for a specific output. Uh, and somewhere along the lines between all the kind of, and I, you know, within doing a residency about publishing as a site of collectivization, of course, it felt natural for people to make a book at some point, but also the invitation to have an exhibition at Goodson Scores Archive. Then it gave us that moment to move over into making. And that exhibition happened uh, about three weeks after the residency finished. So there was this very rapid kind of turnaround of making and collaboration that really activated the space uh, and, and happened and everyone came back for. So, but does anyone else want to talk about the relationship between like how this book came out of what actually happened and maybe the expectations that you had going into the residency compared to uh, how we sit here now launching this? Uh, That's kind of something later. Mm -hmm. I was thinking was how it felt from the inside. Yeah. So for the people who were participating yeah. in it, how did that grow and how did you think about it? Did you say, oh, that's a, not a good idea? Oh, that's the best idea? From the people who inside, I'm curious, how, how did that feel? Mm, sometimes after feeling it, it's like this like improv comedy, you know, where the rule number one is yes and. And I think this is like also like sometimes how it felt like during the residency, but also during everything else which followed, it was kind of like this, yeah, saying yes to every step and seeing how that would, um, yeah, um, blow, uh, not blow up, but <laughs> um, yeah, and change. And then um, out of that, it was like this natural spiraling movement, I think. And I guess that is also the reason why we are using this circle maybe in our collective as well. I'll also add that um, as Nicholas pointed out, we had an exhibition hosted at Blockage um, three weeks after the finish of the residency. And I think we could have easily, or maybe not easily, but we could have finished at the end of the residency, but then we had this exhibition and we all also produced as individuals, uh, our own publications for that exhibition. So I think just the continuation of momentum after the residency was a bit of a kick. And we, I think we realized how easily it was to keep that kind of, to keep going in that circle as Eva described. So, and I just, yeah, we haven't stopped. And it's interesting that in a way that that first publication that Gabrielle just mentioned was the format that felt right at that time after, you know, meeting fresh and working together for a month was actually uh, separate, it was eight 
separate publications with then one produced by Praxis that was more kind of uh, contextualizing what had happened and bringing kind of resources together that then were deemed as one novel that or one one publication that sat together compared to this one which is an and sort of again a step forward in which the group have worked perhaps collaboratively to make a collective uh, artwork and then from that also as you mentioned invited uh, Hannah Pearson and Martin Werner Matthiessen as extensions of that collaboration and I, I um I kind of have questions about that relationship, for example, between Martin and the others and how that worked out. But I see that uh, Vanessa has a, a hand up. So Vanessa, would you like to ask a question? You're welcome to keep going for now. No, no, it's, it's great. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm not sure. It, well, I, I was trying to formulate how what the question was. Um, but basically, I was drawn to come to this event, um, partly because I'm interested in what you what Praxis is up to anyway, but also this concept of the book as art, um, because it is, you know, sort of literature and visual arts and music and you know, these things are all kind of have their different categories. And um, I was also recently in the, the particular PDF forum, I think that Rachel mentioned recently with Marty Manon, um, chatting hi <laughs> um and i was also he also talked about a an exhibition that he did which was a book and the book was the exhibition um and I'll, i hope he'll forgive me if i'm saying it, describing it wrong but i loved the concept that you went to the exhibition space and the book was the exhibit and so right you were sort of reading the book which had external links uh, to artworks that he'd written short stories about i think they were like romance stories if I remember correctly um and um but that you went to the gallery to experience the reading the book in the gallery space so sort of altering the experience of of the book the idea of the book and so I guess um I'm really curious about this idea of bringing this I'm a musician and a visual artist and trying to combine these different sort of elements um rather than them just sort of staying yeah um in these separate worlds and so what you guys have done here is just curious for me like um that it's what what i guess one question is what do you think the potential is for the book as the artwork itself um as an artwork itself um in this, in a different genre, um, because obviously an artwork is, uh, a book is an artwork of its own kind, but, um, and also like, um, I'm also curious about this, the process behind writing this book. So, cause the process it seems from what you guys have talked about was, um, I mean, the writing of a book is not so often collaborative past two people um so and what is that sorry i'm i feel like i'm babbling here i'm trying to just formulate my thoughts here um <laughs> maybe i should have waited a second but basically i guess i'm curious about the the fact that the book itself as an art form outside of where it normally exists and what the potential for that is going forward um and um how you what you think about the process and collaboration collaborate collaboration process of the idea of this book concept because it was the tactile nature of things that really struck me i think um i'm a very tactile person and i love and especially when it comes to books the the smell of a book uh the feeling of a book the way the sound of the pages turn and things like that that's um yeah it's really interesting to bring that forward in this in a new light so i apologize for the babble there but if anyone has any thoughts or comments on that that would be really great thank you i can maybe it, smell, it smells pretty good this book yes pe pe off you go. i i haven't actually done that before <laughs> actually had a sniff but it's just, it's a really good smelling book i can drop a vouch for that <laughs> Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, 
just could say something about the second question about the process that um, for us in the residency it was kind of like a fruitful confusion I would say that continued from the first days of the residency because we didn't know each other and we didn't really have a set goal either what to do I mean so we developed we it was like a process of first getting to know each other and then finding out what to do and that's been kind of something that has continued since um and anyway for me like as a part of the group also this publication has been a continuation of that also because it's been hard to grasp what it will turn out to be all along and yeah the, there was a, some comments about this in the the little presentation we had all this like communication you do and there's so many people involved and then we involved even more people and it became like yeah but this kind of became something that made you made anyway that's my experience that made us going forward um and to me the book as it is now like also how it is made the material or like the layout of it it is a very good materialization somehow of how it's been from the beginning i think so if i can also just comment back on that before anyone else maybe has something to say it's interesting what you just said about the confusion in the process um just the way that you guys mentioned something similar to that in your presentation also made me breathe a big sigh of relief in a way. It's sort of this thing that I think isn't, um, hear, hearing people talk about the, the confusion in, an, in a process of any kind, even in an individual's artistic process is always kind of encouraging and comforting to hear sometimes, but it kind of made me think in terms of a book process, not that I've ever written a book before, but hearing authors talk about the, the process of, you know, the floating ideas, which is also the same in other genres, I know, but trying to, you didn't know each other. So you sort of, it's almost like finding your characters for the book and working out where they're placed and what their goals are and what they're actually gonna do. Kind of, maybe that's going a bit meta, but that kind of made me, want to, made me think of that. <laughs> Could I could I step in for a moment and um, uh, and just say uh, this is this is very much a book about books, but it's also about and in fact the, in the introduction there's a reflection on a discussion point that the group um, uh, were kicking around um, in the course of the residency, uh, you know about the very definition of what it is to publish. I mean one of the questions that the group asked themselves is is actually could have form of recorded performance become a form of publication. Um, so the book takes actually a very plastic idea of the nature of what publication must actually consist of. And in some of the case studies, there are examples of, um, uh, of individuals who are using the digital realm um, and who are intervening in public discourse in a highly kind of activist, in a very, very inventive and activist fashion. Um, in order to think in the broadest possible terms about the possibility for collaboration and collectivity and radical action and, and, and publishing understood in its broadest sense. Um, so while the book has aspects, it has many faces and it has highly creative, imaginative, um, uh, maybe even anarchic approach to, to, to language and to print forms in some places. In others, it becomes really quite kind of quite quite gritty and quite informative. It has quite um, you know academically researched elements to it as well. Um, so it's covering lots of bases really in relation to make to be praxis's larger role as a catalyzer, as a catalyst for um, for action kind of within its residency, but also actually much more widely across its locality and 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 you know as far as far as it can reach. So um, 
underlying some of the editorial decisions were ones to do with, you know, how do we inform and how do we catalyze people's own independent ideas and, action, and ideally, you know, actions in relation to the incredible possibilities in this field. And, and the, the continuing collaboration of the residents is one important outcome from the residency and, uh, and a correlate of the book. Um, but, um, you know, we're hoping that this will, this will have further effects um, as it gets disseminated and people start reading it and following the many research leads and, and creative leads that it contains. What I'm thinking um, now is probably a good moment to shift over to the game, the invitation, actually, I'm going to put in the chat. So there's the invitation from ADEG MPV uh, to participate in their collective game. So there's a link uh, in the chat uh, just below where I've re-put the link uh, that you can have a look at Printed Matters virtual art book fair. And at Printed Matter, you can also watch the whole of the video that was shown right at the beginning of this event as well, if you'd like to see more of that. Uh, or in fact, if you missed it. Um, but yeah, so I'm clicking that link now. Is there any instructions from anyone in the group? And um, at this point, it's probably a good time to say to those who need to move on to other things, thank you for being part of this event. We've recorded it, and so we'll put a link through to it if you want to review any elements of it or the whole thing um, via the Praxis website. Um, so now we're at a kind of a we're we're at a uh, what is it? So we're at a uh, a project fork <laughs> with those who would wish to carry on yeah. and work with the group um, on the on a collect collectively authored document um, is possibility number two. Uh, on the other hand, if you do need to move on to other events or to uh, indeed, you know, enjoy your Saturday, well, it's Saturday night here in the UK at any rate, um, then thank you for attending and, uh, and, and please visit the Praxis website to find out more about all the other activities that we're involved with. Yes, yeah, so indeed. And so thank you for everyone who's presented and everyone who, again, to everyone who's been part of making uh, Don't Resonate possible. Um, and then a huge thank you to everyone who's joined today. I hope at uh, some point you'll get your, hand, your hands on a copy of the book. Uh, even though I do say so myself, I think it is uh, well worth it. Um, but yeah, and then I hope as many people as possible will be able to join the game now. But yeah, so thank you.